Niels Bohr was a Danish physicist that made massive contributions to quantum physics, respectfully butted heads with the great Albert Einstein, and helped people escape from the Nazis. In this video, we'll look at some of his work that formed the core foundations of physics as we know it. Hello there, I'm Barth, and in this video I'm recovering from a slight cold, so please excuse my voice. Now, I've made lots of videos on this channel about unique and interesting details of quantum theory, but today we'll look at some fundamentals, as worked on by Niels Bohr. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. The first thing we'll be looking at is Niels Bohr's model of the atom. Many of us might be familiar with the idea that within an atom, we'll normally find a nucleus at the center. In this nucleus will be protons, positively charged particles, and sometimes neutrons, neutral particles. We may also know that electrons, small negatively charged particles, can be found outside the nucleus. But exactly how are they arranged there? Well, this is what Bohr worked on. But to understand this, we need to go back in time, to just before the development of the Bohr model. Niels Bohr worked closely with and learned from another brilliant scientist called Ernest Rutherford. He had realized through an experiment he devised with his students that atoms are formed of negatively charged particles surrounding a very intensely positive region at the center, with most of the atom being empty space. This experiment was known as the gold foil experiment since they fired positively charged alpha particles at a thin piece of gold foil. Rutherford expected to see most alpha particles just passing straight through, because at the time, scientists thought that atoms had negative charges spread out evenly throughout a weakly positive region, with the overall positive charge balancing the negative charges. So some alpha particles would be weakly repelled by the positive charge and weakly attracted by the negative charges, and so only be deflected by small amounts compared to how they went in. However, what Rutherford and his students saw was very different. Yes, most particles did indeed pass through with minimal deflection, but some particles deflected a fair amount, close to 90 degrees, and a very small proportion even came back almost towards the emitter. Rutherford said that this was like firing a shell at a piece of tissue paper and it coming back to hit you. Definitely unexpected. So he realized that the big deflections were caused by very strong positive regions, as opposed to the total positive charge being spread out over a large region and therefore interacting weakly with alpha particles because it was so spread out. The fact that only a small amount of alpha particles deflected so much also confirmed that the strong positive regions should be confined to small spaces with the rest of the atom having to be empty space pretty much. Based on this evidence, Rutherford came up with a model of the atom that showed some beautiful symmetry between these tiny particles and something much bigger, the solar system itself. He thought that, just like how the planets orbit the sun, the electrons in an atom should orbit the positively charged nucleus. And this was the planetary model that seemed to explain many atomic behaviors very reasonably. Except there was a problem. If the negative electrons were to orbit the nucleus, then they would constantly be moving in a circle or some other such shape, maybe an ellipse, constantly changing direction. And constantly changing direction means that they would be constantly accelerating. Remember that an object that accelerates changes its velocity over time. And velocity is a vector quantity with both size and direction. So in order to accelerate, an object doesn't necessarily have to get faster or slower. It could move at the same speed if it changed direction. And the physics of charged objects told us that any accelerating charged objects must emit radiation and lose energy. This is given by the Lama formula. Looks complicated, but it just gives us the power emitted, energy per unit time, by a given charge accelerating at a given rate. What this implies is that electrons that orbit a nucleus must in fact emit radiation, lose energy, and spiral inwards. In this model, all atoms would be unstable. And as the electron spiraled in, the radiation would change frequency continuously, meaning we'd get all different wavelengths. Essentially, the light coming from the atom would change color continuously, assuming we could see it and that it was emitting in the visible part of the EM spectrum. In reality, though, we saw that atoms were indeed stable. Electrons did not spiral into the nucleus, and atoms did emit radiation sometimes, but not the continuously changing radiation that the planetary model predicted. Instead, when atoms were given some energy by shining light or EM radiation on them, 
they could then emit energy at a later time, but they only emitted this energy at very specific wavelengths or frequencies. In other words, we only ever saw specific colours coming from atoms of particular elements, not the continuum that the planetary model predicted. Bohr realised that there must be something else going on here, namely that there must be something holding electrons in specific positions or specific distances away from the nucleus. This way, electrons could move only from one allowed energy level to another, and if they were losing energy going towards the nucleus, the electrons would emit radiation that matched the specific energy difference between the two levels. So, for example, an electron moving from this energy level to this energy level would release radiation at a specific frequency that corresponded to one of the ones we saw being emitted by the whole atom. The other frequencies emitted by the atom would be a result of the other possible transitions for the electrons. Great, this improved upon Rutherford's planetary model, but why would electrons be restricted to these random, allowed energy levels? What kept them there? Well, Bohr helped us get partway to the answer to this question. He discovered a mathematical rule that described the allowed locations of these energy levels away from the nucleus. The answer came from the, at the time, rapidly developing quantum theory. Bohr realised that in order for the emission frequencies from his model to match those found in experiments, the energy levels had to be in very specific places. Remember that in these energy levels, Bohr assumed that the electrons were indeed orbiting the nucleus, just like Rutherford thought. And because they were orbiting, they had a property called angular momentum. Any object moving along a curved path, or rotating, has angular momentum. It so happened that an electron's angular momentum in a particular energy level was equal to a multiple of the reduced Planck constant, one of the most important constants in quantum physics. It comes up everywhere. And it must have been really exciting for him to realise that in the first energy level, the angular momentum of the electron was equal to h-bar, the reduced Planck constant. In the second, it was two times h-bar. In the third, it was three times h-bar, and so on. So let's quickly take a look at the other side of this equation, the angular momentum. An object's angular momentum when it moves in a circle is given by multiplying the mass of the object by its speed, by the radius of the circle along which it's moving. Well, the mass of the electron is constant and was known at the time fairly well, and the radius was exactly what we were trying to calculate. So if we knew the speed of the electron in a given orbit, we could calculate how far away the electron was orbiting from the centre of the atom. Well, if each energy level is to be stable, so that the electron doesn't spiral inwards, as the classical theory suggested, then the force acting on the electron has to be the centripetal force needed to keep it at that distance from the nucleus. So the electromagnetic force caused by our negative electron being attracted to the positive nucleus is equal to the centripetal force. And from this, we can work out the speed at which the electron will move at a particular distance in terms of things like the charges on the electron and the nucleus, the mass of the electron, and the energy level radius. With a bit of rearranging and substituting, we can then figure out the allowed radii at which electrons can orbit the nucleus in Bohr's model. Now, Bohr's model was quite successful in describing the behaviour of hydrogen and light atoms. It completely changed how we understood atoms, and solved a huge problem found in the models that came before. And in addition to this, Bohr was involved in a huge number of developments in early quantum theory. He even butted heads, respectfully of course, with a great Albert Einstein. Einstein hated how quantum mechanics was becoming a probabilistic theory, suggesting that repeating the same experiment over and over again may not always give the same result, even if everything was done perfectly the same, and that we could only know the probability of a particular experimental result before we did the experiment. We couldn't know for certain which result we would get. Einstein even went as far as to say, God does not play dice, alluding to the fact that he believed the universe was not probabilistic. Niels Bohr, in response, said, Einstein, stop telling God what to do, which I find brilliant. And it's this Einstein quote about God playing dice that inspired me to create my merch design, the Schrodinger equation of quantum mechanics on a die. Please do check it out, it's linked in the description below. And if you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and hit that bell button for more fun physics content. Finally, a huge thanks to all of my Giga patrons, as well as everyone else over on my Patreon page. I'll also link that in the description box if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you very soon.